we're continuing our journey through the stories, through the story of the Bible, the grand story of redemption. And we come this morning to the story of Esther, an unbelievably remarkable story for many reasons. It plays out, this story, like a classic comedy. It it tells the story of an incredibly wicked enemy, of an unlikely hero standing up courageously. The day is saved at the last moment. And while it seems like a script from a well-written classic movie, it is a true story of what really happened of what God really did in the lives of his people, and it is connected to the grand story of redemption, to the upper story of God's redemptive history. Just as we have seen play out in story after story, it's ultimately about God as the hero, about his redemptive plan through a family, which would become a people which would produce an offspring. We've seen promises that God made first to Adam and Eve that their descendant, one would come who would be the snake crusher, who who would crush the enemy of God once and for all. We saw the promise to Abraham that his offspring would be a blessing to all nations. We saw the promise to David that one of David's heirs would sit on his throne and rule forever. All of the big promises, the covenants of God, depend on a one offspring, the one seed, the one heir who was to come. And all of these promises depend on the existence of the family. This family line must continue for God's promises to be fulfilled. Some people have asked, where is God in Esther? Esther is famous in the Bible in that God is never mentioned in the book. There is nothing even about sacrifices or laws or covenants or promises. Nothing big miraculous happens in the book of Esther. And and it leads me to think about my own life, and I have often asked at times, where is God in my life? I haven't heard big, obvious voices from heaven. I've not seen any big, miraculous things in my life. Where is God in my story? Where is God speaking to me? The story of God revealing himself to Elijah is is a famous one, where Elijah looks for the voice of God in the shaking of the mountain, and then in the fire and in the earthquake and in the great wind. And then finally, God speaks to him in a still, small voice. Sometimes in my life, I feel like I even miss the still, small voice. Is God really involved in my life? Is he really present in my story? And does he really care about what's happening to me? But just like in the case of Esther, just like in the story we'll look at today, with some perspective and the benefit of looking back, God's hand is clear on every page of the story. God's providential leading and guiding and orchestrating of events is clear in every moment of what happens. When life seems bleakest, God keeps rescuing me. When all things seem hopeless, God keeps showing up. And and maybe even in the moment in a way where it doesn't look like a miracle, but after some time and perspective, we look back and see it clearly was. The story of Esther is about everyday providence everyday providence, that God is at work every day in every moment of our lives. And it's a story about God using people to be a part of his plan. Imperfect people 
who seem to do so little and yet using people. Esther takes place in the time of the exile when the both the, the northern and southern kingdom, which we talked about last week, have already been conquered. The people have been led away into captivity, and they've been living in a foreign land now for some time, even, even for generations. And, and Esther and Mordecai are two of the Jews who have been taken away and live in the empire of the Medes and the Persians. See, the Babylonians first took the people of Judah captive, and now the Persian Empire has taken over and is reigning over the scattered Jewish people. This empire is a great empire of history, uh, maybe the first in a line of empires. If you know about history, great, great governments, great empires who conquer most of the known world. We've come to this time in history when empires reigned. And the Jews become, much as we understand them to be today, a scattered people, a, a, a minority that is scattered throughout the world that is often hated, despised, and looked down upon. And while some Jewish people have returned already by this point in the story in Esther to Jerusalem, and, and they're starting to rebuild the temple already, Esther and Mordecai remain as exiles in a foreign land. So we're going to jump into the story this morning. Our reading is going to be from Esther chapter 4. If you have a blue Bible from the sides, I believe it's page 234. Esther chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. And if you are willing and able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you, you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. You may be seated. As this is a, a, a fantastic story, and God has presented to us in the form of a story and preserved it for us in the Bible as basically a storybook, we're going to spend the most of our time this morning telling the story, retelling the events as they happened. And in the middle, we're going to consider three of the key statements that the main characters make, which point to the goodness of and the providence of God. Three statements which we read this morning in Esther chapter 4. The first being what Mordecai says, that salvation will come, whether you're a part of it or not. The second being Mordecai saying, maybe you have been placed in the kingdom for such a time as this. And lastly, Esther's reply, if I perish, I perish. The story begins with a Hasuerus. Has sounds like a dinosaur, a Hasosaurus. <laughs> In Greek, this same character is known as Xerxes, which is much easier to say, so we will call him Xerxes. He is a famous and mighty warrior ruler. He has experienced 
great success, conquering, again, as we've talked about, most of the known world. And we see him here at really the height of his rule. And we open the book of Esther on a scene of great celebration, a party that Xerxes has thrown for all of the kingdom on behalf of his rule for, to celebrate his success a party that lasts 180 days, culminating in a one-week extravaganza, a great banquet, a most lavish party. The, the Bible even tells us there were fancy curtains and couches. And lots and lots to drink. The Bible refers to the drinking and says this, there was only one rule, there are no rules. Seems like one of those silly commercials back in the day. There's no rules. The Bible says that, that the, the king ordered his servants to do whatever the, the participants at the party wanted to keep bringing them drink after drink after drink. And we come to a part in the party with the men, the, the advisors to the king. After they had drunk quite a bit, they're sitting around together, and Xerxes is bragging about how hot his wife is. You guys have to see how beautiful Queen Vashti is. She is something else. And, you know, as drunk men tend to do in a circle like this, uh, they decide that he needs to prove it. And so the king sends word to Vashti to be brought before them, basically to, to be paraded before the men and ogled. For the men to lust after her. Now Vashti, as I think is maybe a response that goes, well, yeah. She says, no, I'm not doing that. That doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. I'm not going to go parade in front of all your drunk friends. And she refuses. But for a mighty ruler like Xerxes, no one disobeys an order. How dare she? How dare she? And the king is described as being enraged. How dare she disrespect the king in this way? And when the men get together, the brain trust, if you will, the brilliance that they come up with is, yeah, how, that was disrespect. How dare she? What are you going to do, Xerxes? You know, what this means is if she can get away with this, is if Vashti is allowed to get away with this supreme disrespect, what are all the other women in the land going to do? How are we as men, as rulers in the kingdom, going to control our wives? If the queen is allowed to disrespect the king, how dare she? So the brain trust, the drunk friends, come up with a plan to banish Vashti. She is no longer worthy of being called the queen. She can no longer come before the king. And, and this edict, this, this declaration should be sent to all the land as a warning to all other women. Don't disrespect your husbands. And so the king thinks, of course, this is a great idea to teach some respect. And he sends out the edict throughout the land, specifically to banish Queen Vashti. Now, that when this happens, it creates a new issue. There is no queen. That, and that can't happen. A great king like Xerxes must have a queen on his arm. And so, another brilliant idea, probably from the brain trust, a beauty contest. What a great idea. Let's have a beauty contest. Let's parade all the eligible women, all the unmarried virgins in the land before the king. And the king will get to sit and watch as they go past and judge them on their looks and pick out the one that he likes best. And so we get to the final rounds of this contest, and we meet a young Jewish girl named Hadassah, or Esther. 
She is an orphan who has been brought up by her cousin Mordecai, and she has made it through to Hollywood. She got the golden ticket. And at this point, she is brought to the place of the woman, women, or the harem, and, and the Bible describes that these finalists in the beauty contest spend a year getting prepared for the final round of the contest, a year to be pampered and perfumed, and the Bible says the word cosmetics, which I just was really funny when you read it, to see the word cosmetics there in the Bible, makeup and perfumes and pampering for a year, haircuts and skin care, and some men maybe have that thought, a year to get ready feels, <laughs> feels like I've been there before. <laughs> <laughs> but the, my wife's in the nursery today, don't tell her I said that. <laughs> Anyways. Esther comes out the final round after the year of being pampered and prepared and made up and the, the Esther wins the, the beauty contest. The king chooses her to be his new queen to replace Vashti who has been banished. Meanwhile, Esther's cousin Mordecai hangs around the king's gate really to keep an eye on Esther, to, to make sure that she's okay. Now she doesn't live with him anymore. She lives in the palace, and he wants to keep an eye on her. He cares for her, and while he is sitting there near the palace, he hears two men plotting to kill the king. Two men happen to be talking in earshot of Mordecai, coming up with a plan on how they can assassinate Xerxes. And Mordecai as a good citizen, as soon as he can, tells Esther about the plot, and she tells the right people who tell the right people, and the plot is stopped, is foiled before it can even begin. And as a key point in the story, Mordecai's good deed is recorded in the King's Book of Chronicles. At this point, we see another character come into the scene the wicked Haman. The story of Esther is still told amongst the Jewish people today, and we'll talk about a little bit later that it, that it established a new festival, the festival of Purim, and during the festival of Purim, the story is read aloud, but the children in, in the Jewish culture are handed out noisemakers so that they, they can shake the noisemakers whenever the name of Haman is said so no one can hear his name. He is a wicked and evil man. He is also a man of great authority in the empire with access to the king. Haman is descended from the Amalekites and hates the Jews, hates them with a passion. This, this hatred is only antagonized by his relationship with Mordecai. Mordecai knows Haman knows the kind of man that he is, and while other people bow down to Haman as he walks through the streets, Mordecai refuses, despite his position. Haman hates the Jews so much, he wants to wipe them off the face of the earth, to destroy them completely. This is, again, something we see throughout history, the Jews' position as a hated people's as the target of annihilation. And Haman begins planning to do just that, to wipe every Jew off the face of the earth. And his plan is to set a date when killing the Jews is legal for anybody. And in fact, whoever kills a Jewish person can take over all their land and property. And through some level of trickery and smooth talking and bribery, Haman gets the king's approval for his plan. And he writes it up in a decree that re receives the royal seal. All that is left to do is to decide exactly when this will take place. Exactly when is that day when it's legal to kill the Jews. And so Haman, to decide the day, rolls a pair of dice to determine which date he will pick. Wherever the dice land is the day when the Jewish slaughter will happen. And it comes up Adair 13, 
which is 11 months away. The edict is sealed with the king's ring and sent throughout the kingdom. And while Haman and the king drink to celebrate themselves, the Jews are horrified. They understand exactly what this means. And Mordecai receives the news and weeps and wails. He covers himself in sackcloth and ashes and went back to the king's gate crying out. This, this picture of public sorrow, of public weeping is, is something that is common to this culture, to dress yourself in sackcloth and to sit in ashes and to go out in public and to wail and to mourn. Now, Esther finds out that Mordecai is in the streets weeping and wailing. And Esther is bothered by this. Esther is embarrassed. And first she sends clothes to Mordecai so he can clean himself up. She gives some clothes to his servants and said, go take it to Mordecai. Tell him to put something on and get out of the street. Mordecai refuses to accept them. And so Esther goes down herself to find out what's going on, and Mordecai then tells her all that has happened, tells her about the edict and Haman's plot to kill the Jews. And up to this point, Esther has keepin, kept her heritage hidden in the royal court. Nobody knows that she is a Jew. But this edict is binding. The king's edict, once sealed, cannot be undone. The people know this, and the Jews are living in terror anticipating the day when their neighbor will come for them. Mordecai now comes up with a plan for Esther to go and present the Jewish case before the king. And now we come to the section which we read in chapter 4, in which we have these three profound statements. The first in chapter 4, verse 14a, where Mordecai says, if you keep silent, at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And what I, what I love about this story is there are kind of these two twin truths found in, in that statement and in what happens with Esther. The two twin truths are that, that God doesn't need you. He doesn't need you, and yet God wants to use you. God wants to use you, to invite you to be a part of his plan. So first, nothing of eternal significance depends on me. Nothing of eternal significance depends on you. What that means to me, and maybe this is just the way that I think, that means to me is I can't screw it up. I can't mess it up. That, that, that the fear, a great fear in my life is of screwing things up. And fear so many times drives me to inaction. And when it, especially when it comes to things that really matter, like sharing my faith, I become so afraid of doing the wrong thing, of saying the wrong thing. I feel the weight of responsibility, and I don't want to mess things up. But the great truth of God's providence is that he will make happen exactly what he wants to have happen. God's plan will happen. God's promises will be fulfilled. And it is a statement of great faith, even here, that Mordecai makes, that salvation will come for the Jews. God will keep his promise to the chosen people because, as we talked about at the beginning, his ultimate rescue, his ultimate plan of Jesus depends on the survival of the Jewish people. God's providence will make things happen exactly as he wants them to happen. But he wants to use you. He's inviting you to be a part of this grand plan. And as we talk about the stories of the Bible, and it's one big grand story of redemption, one epic story throughout history, God is inviting you to play a role in that story. 
in his plan of redemption, he, he graciously offers us an honored place as his messengers, as his hands and feet, as his body, to share, even in some small way, the victory that he accomplishes. But make no mistake, if we keep silent, God will bring his salvation to those he intends on saving no matter what. Feel the relief of the burden and the joy of the invitation. In, in this mysterious balance between God's providential control and personal choice and responsibility, God has chosen to invite us to be a part of his plan. And then Mordecai utters the, the next statement, the wise words which have been repeated, maybe the most famous statement in the book of Esther for such a time as this. Maybe, maybe this moment, maybe this exact crisis is exactly why Esther has been brought into the palace. Exactly why God created her beautiful. Exactly why she was born at the exact time and place that she was born. Maybe this moment is why God brought you to this place. And, and maybe it explains the suffering in our life. Maybe the, the, all the things that you went through to lead you to right now God was using to prepare you for such a time as this, right now. Maybe you have put, been put in this job, or this house, or this relationship for such a time as this. Maybe someone needs you to be the messenger of God simply because you are in the right place at the right time. It is no coincidence that you find yourself where you find yourself. There are, there are no coincidences. And that is one of the beauties of the story of Esther, as we'll talk about it a little bit later. But there are no coincidences. God is providentially at work, sovereignly controlling your life, and has brought you to this place. And maybe you went through what was leading up to this moment for such a time as this. Maybe you went through the horrible pain and loss for such a time as this when you can minister to someone going through horrible pain and loss. Where has God put you for such a time as this? It is no accident. So Esther is placed by God in the palace, but it is not without risk. The plan which Mordecai has is not without risk. The problem is that there are rules, and the rules are serious. We saw what happened to Vashti. No one is to go before the king without being invited. In fact, if someone does go before the king without a royal invitation, he is to be immediately executed without trial or delay. Unless, and the only caveat, the only way of escape is if the king raises his scepter to accept their presence. And Esther knows this and she is understandably nervous. She decides to go anyway. And she says those famous words, if I perish, I perish. I will do this. I will, I will, I will go before the king on behalf of the Jewish people. I will, I will play my part in the, the, the plan of God, which Mordecai has told to her. And, and I know the risks. And if I perish, I perish. See, that's a question of priorities. It's a question of what is of supreme importance to us and the question for us is, are we willing to give up everything, even important things, for what is ultimate? For God and his people, for Jesus and the redemptive plan of history, Esther is willing to lay down her life, willing to leave her comfortable position in the palace, to risk her life to save the people. Are we willing to give up even the good things in life? What are our priorities? The question, as Jesus asks it, is what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? 
Are we focused on gaining the whole world? Are we focused on the soul? On what is eternal? On what is of supreme importance? Can we say with Paul that we have learned how to be in want and how to have plenty and how to have good things and, and how to not have anything and whatever we have we count as worthless compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus? Where are our priorities? So Esther goes before the king, and the king not only raises his scepter, but welcomes her warmly. She has so pleased the king that he says to her, what do you want? I will grant you any request, even up to half my kingdom. So Esther says, my request is that you, King Xerxes and Haman, come to a dinner party. So they do. They have a nice dinner, and they eat together, and they celebrate, and, and they have good food and wine. And, and at the end of the dinner, the king astutely asks, knows that Esther wants something more. Asks Esther, what, what is it that you really want? Why, what do you want to ask? And in a funny detail, I don't, I don't know if, if Esther lost her nerve or if this was the plan all along, but Esther says, okay, king, I've asked you to this dinner party so that I could ask you to another dinner party. Tomorrow night is the real party. This party was the setup. This party was for the invitation. This was the save the date. And tomorrow is the real party. So I want to invite you and Haman back to another party tomorrow. And it's a weird detail at first, but it comes to be crucial to the story. Because between the parties, so much happens. So much happens. The first thing that happens is Haman does some plotting. He walks away from the dinner party and sees Mordecai who doesn't bow down to him after he has just had dinner with the king and queen. Does Mordecai know who he is? He's the only one invited to a special intimate dinner party with the king and queen and still Mordecai doesn't bow down to me. That's the last straw. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him as soon as I possibly can. And Haman does some plotting, sets up even a gallows in front of his house as the means of execution for Mordecai. That same night, the king can't sleep. The king has insomnia. And as kings do when they can't sleep, he orders the book of the chronicles of the king to be read to him when he can't sleep. Because nothing better to put you to sleep than a list of your own accomplishments. <laughs> and among the things that happened to be read to the king on that night between the parties when the king can't sleep is the story of Mordecai and how he overheard the plot sitting at the city gates to assassinate the king and how Mordecai saved the king's life. And the king starts to think about how Mordecai should be rewarded for this act. And he asks his servant, have we done anything in thanks to honor Mordecai for what he has done on behalf of the king? And they say, no, we haven't done anything yet. And so the king thinks, what should I do? What would be a fitting reward for the man who saved my life? Now, just so happens, at that exact time, Haman walks in and stands before the king and his plan is to tell the king of his plot to kill Mordecai and to get the king's permission to kill his enemy. And the king doesn't allow him to start his speech but instead asks Haman, what should I do to reward the faithful servant of the king? What should the king do to the one he loves to honor? Now, Haman thinks, well, of course, he's talking about me. Of course, I am the servant whom he wants to honor. Of course, he wants to reward me. And it just so happens I've done some thinking on this area. <laughs> I've got some ideas. Here's the first thing. Royal robe, of course, has to be put on the servant's shoulders. Rings, oh, definitely king's royal rings, a horse that the king has ridden on, 
definitely a great honor for that servant it would be. And to be paraded through the city streets and for it to be announced that this is the servant that the king loves to honor. What a great idea that is. Mm, it'll be great. And this elaborate plan he presents to the king and the king says, great idea. I agree. All of it. Let's do it. Do it for Mordecai. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, this story is unbelievable. So Haman, now Haman, who happened to be in the presence of the king, gets assigned the task of honoring Mordecai and has to be the one who leads him through the streets yelling, this is a faithful servant of the king. The king wants to honor him. Look at this guy. He's great. And Imagine how it eats up Haman inside. And he spends all day walking through the streets honoring Mordecai. And, and, and as he's done, finally, oh, what that was awful. He goes home and he begins to complain <coughs> to his family about the terrible thing that has happened to him that day. And, and, and just as he is getting into, have you ever been complaining that way and you're just like settling into it? Like, oh, I'm just getting started. You don't have any idea how bad things have been. Let me tell you about it. And just as Haman is settling in to complain to his wife and his friends, the bell rings or the servant comes or whatever happens and he is summoned to the second dinner party. And so they have the dinner party, and this time, Esther doesn't waste any time. This time, Esther explains to the king the real reason which she has invited them to this dinner party, explains the plot to kill the Jews, reveals that she is a Jew and in danger of being killed by Haman's plot in front of Haman. And the king is so mad. The king is mad that, that someone would come up with this plan that would kill his queen. And the king doesn't even know what to say, and he leaves the room. And he walks out to his terrace or whatever to cool down. This time, Haman knows he is beaten knows that everything has fallen apart in his plot, and he begins to plead for his life from Esther. And just as, in another coincidence, just as Haman falls onto Esther's couch to beg for his life, the king walks back into the room and sees Haman making what seems to be an aggressive move towards Esther. And that is it. That is the final straw, and Haman is marched out, the, it says his face is covered, and, and the servants grab him right away, and, and someone lets out that, do you know that Haman has built a gallows in front of his house? And the king says, perfect, hang him on that. So, Mordecai's now given a place of honor. Mordecai now is elevated to the place that Haman has left as a void, and now Mordecai is tasked with a new plan to def allow the Jews to defend themselves. Because even though this edict, which went out earlier, cannot be undone, it can be amended. It can be added to. And so Mordecai's new plan is for the Jews to defend themselves and even to be given support by the, the royal guard, by the king's armies, to, to fight against their enemies. They're allowed to fight back. And their day of extermination instead becomes a day of deliverance. And this becomes the Feast of Purim. This is established at the end of the book of Esther as a time to remember, to commemorate the salvation of the Jews because God preserves his people for his plan. Again, God is famously never mentioned in the book of Esther, but he is clearly present on every page of the story. Let's just quickly talk about the coincidences and list them off one in a row. The downfall of Vashti, 
the decision to hold a beauty contest to replace her, Mordecai's overhearing of a plot to kill the king, Esther in position before Haman's plot takes place, the king's insomnia on the night before Mordecai's execution, Haman entering just as the king wonders how to reward Mordecai, and the king's return just when Haman falls on Esther's couch. One commentator said it this way, the deliverances experienced here in Esther is very different from the exodus of Egypt in the time of Moses. There are no signs and wonders, no special revelation, no prophet like Moses, and no one even mentions God. Yet the way the story is told makes it clear that even when God is most hidden, he is still present and working to protect and deliver his chosen people. God is in control and is at work and is at work in your life even when it doesn't feel like it. Even when you can't see what he is doing and you can't hear his voice, God is at work and there are no coincidences. He has you exactly where he has you. I love Proverbs 16.33 which is so appropriate because this, this story contains a roll of the dice And Proverbs 16, 33 says, the lot is cast or the dice is rolled in the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. Even the roll of the dice God is in control of. Because God made promises that he intends to keep. Promises that depend on a descendant from the family line. Promises that the world would be saved through the offspring of these people and if the Jews had been allowed to be wiped off the face of the earth he could not bring Jesus to heal the nations God's plan is all about Jesus the awaited Messiah and even in Esther even in the story which doesn't mention God we can see God's hand at work because of Jesus because he intends to bring the Messiah. Isaiah 46, 9 through 11 says this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. God is at work. Even when the wick of the candle is all but extinguished, when the edict goes out that all is lost, God is at work. He does not need you. His plan will be accomplished, but he is inviting you to come be a part of his plan. He wants to use you for your own good so that you can have a part in his plan. And he keeps his promises. He saves his people always and supremely through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for what you have done, for what you are doing and for what you will do even in our lives. And God, we confess that we have despaired and thought you to be absent and wondered where you were and wondered what you were doing. But God, we we confess that we believe that you are in control, that you have a plan and it is good. And God, thank you that you want to use us as part of that plan. God, allow us to have the courage to step forward, to have the priorities to say we would give up anything else to be a part of your plan, to be closer to you, King Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.